you a woman searching for purpose and success? A housewife? Maybe a single mother? You're in the right place. Welcome to Savvy Speaks Empowerment Podcast with Ms. Lisa Nobles. Activate. Motivate. Inspire. Hello, 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 everyone, and welcome to the Savvy Speaks Empowerment Podcast. I am Miss Lisa Nobles, your hostess, and I am so excited to have you join in with me today. Speaking of today, our topic consists of becoming the financial stability your parents always wanted you to marry. I have a very important guest joining me today for this special empowerment segment at the Savvy Speaks Roundtable. This segment is dedicated to becoming financially secure and teaching others the importance of developing a financial plan. Here, our guest will share her brightest tips and general advice about finance towards building financial wealth family. Let's give a warm welcome to our guest queen, Giovanna Dessen, who specializes in finance and encourages others on the importances of developing and maintaining financial stability. Welcome, Giovanna, to the Savvy Speaks Roundtable. Family, our focus today <laughs> is on becoming the financial stability your parents always wanted you to marry. We're going to um, give Giovanna a warm, a warm welcome and allow her to introduce herself. But I want to quickly say that this young woman, I am so proud of her. I'm so elated. Her mother and I grew up at Ministry Church of Christ as single mothers together. And I have watched this baby grow literally from the wound. She's grown into a beautiful young woman. And I am so proud to have her speak to her expertise today. So again, Giovanna, welcome again. And tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you so much first for having me. And it is amazing to speak with you again, because it has been like a very, very, very long time since we have spoken. Mm -hmm. So I'm very proud to be on the show today. So just a little bit about myself. My name is Giovanna Dessen, and I'm currently a college student in my last semester at Keene University, and I'm studying finance. So I'll be graduating in May 2018. I'm so elated. I'm so excited. <laughs> I, I can't believe it. I, I remember her before she was even in kindergarten. <laughs> She's graduating. <laughs> She's graduating from college. Uh, and we're having this <laughs> amazing conversation before we began the recording. And, and we were both just a giggling because I'm like, right. oh my God, we're talking, <laughs> talking to a young woman. She was just a baby. So anyway. I know. I'm so elated about this topic. When I saw it on going through her news feed, I knew that it would be attractive. So our focus today are going to be primarily, of course, college students out, outside of as well as women and minorities, which is uh, Giovanna's specialty. So we're going to jump right in with our discussion today. Again, let's talk about it, family. Becoming the financial stability your parents always wanted you to marry. We are ready to talk finance with Miss Giovanna. So Giovanna, mm -hmm. tell the audience a little bit about your background in finance. Right. So I just want to backtrack a little bit to when I first started college. Um, when I first started college, I was a political science major, yes. and I thought that that was the path for me. But as I got into my classes, I realized that it just wasn't fun for me personally. Yes. And I was kind of stuck. I wanted to know, I wanted to get into a major that I was comfortable in and that I can also relate to as well. Right. So after my first year of college, I ended up um, transferring out of that school because I had to, I had a, uh, I had to pay a bill, you know, right. to continue. And I had to transfer to a community college. Right. So during that time, I, it, it, it really gave me the time to really think things over and to really figure out which path was for me. Right. So um, when I was 18 years old or 19 years old, I got my first job at Macy's. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was making about like $8 an hour, but I didn't really have too many like obligations as far as financial obligations. I didn't have too many bills. Mm -hmm. I just had that one bill that I had to pay for my previous university. And I remember uh, my mom, she, she told me that um, when I got paid to, to pay on my bill, you know, to teach me responsibility. Right. And I remember this was my first job. I never really had like, you know, just my own money coming in. It always came from my parents. So I didn't really know how to manage my finances. So 
one thing I really appreciate about my mom is that she never forced me to make payments to my school. She never said, right. give me your check. I'm going to pay it. She gave me the choice. And I personally made a choice not to. And I remember all, on my breaks at work, I would always try to run into Forever 21 or any different stores to try to shop, as, you know, to try to try buy as much as I can. Mm-hmm. And I just remember that I always looked amazing. Like I always had the nicest clothes, but I had like $2 in my pocket. Right. So I got tired of looking like I had it versus actually having the money, you know? Right. And so as I got into um, my second semester at the community college that I went to, all of a sudden, you know, finance just started to, it just dawned on me that maybe finance should be my, my avenue as far as where I should take my life, you know, next. Right. Cause I was really passionate about the money and us actually knowing what to do with the money when we have it versus actually about it. And I remember I asked them, it was, it was at two different times, but it's so, it's such a coincidence. Their answer was the same, but I asked them, how did you get your start into investing? You know, could right. you tell me how it goes? And both of their responses were the same. It was kind of like, oh, I, I don't really know. I just kind of just did it. You just kind of have to learn, just kind of how to do it. And I realized that a lot of people, when it comes to finance specifically, they don't really want to give you the ins and outs of finance, especially right. when they read financial success. They kind of want to just keep it to themselves. And it's like, especially within our community, our black community, right. it's, it's every man for himself. And it's really sad because amongst other ethnic groups, you know, everybody, everybody helps each other. But when it comes to our community, our black community, we don't help each other out, unfortunately. And so that's another reason why I wanted to have a platform for finance, because I felt like with this platform, it'll help me be able to give financial tips to people, to college students, to women, to minorities that will actually, you know, teach them what they should do with their finances when they actually get, you know, get money. How should they monitor the money, manage the money? How should they save the money? Because it's just a lot of people who try to keep that to themselves. And it's really sad. You know, I feel like if we reach the top, you know, we should send the elevator back down and allow people to also be able to come to the top as well. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the main reasons why I wanted to get into finance to kind of teach people because I feel like it's such a a, a lack of literacy in our community. Like, we, and you know, it's just, that's, that was just my passion. It, it still is my passion to really teach others about the importance of credit, saving. You know, that's one of the main reasons why I wanted to get into finance, to be the person to really um, open up people's eyes, to teach people, because a lot of people just don't want to discuss how they were able to reach the financial wealth that they were able to, you know, get to. So, yeah. I, I, I love that. I, you bring up a couple of great points. And one that I want to kind of capitalize upon is when you're, I love this point you made. You said, when we reach the top, we should send the elevator back down. Right. I love that. Expound upon that tip. What, what made you come to that conclusion outside of, I, I mean, I understand some of the other things you're saying that in our community, mm-hmm. We kind of are a little bit selfish and we don't share right. the wealth with others. So I, I love that. Expound upon that tip a little bit more, if you don't mind. Right. So a lot of the times people will um, reach success and they're very hush-hush about it. And it's pretty sad because they see people amongst our community. And I'm speaking for the black community in, in, in specific, but they see right. us, you know, making decisions, making poor decisions. And a lot of times we don't even know we're making those poor decisions, you know? Right. And when we, when we reach out, we ask for help, we get the response of, oh, I just kind of just had to figure it out. And I just kind of had to learn about right. it. And I feel like that's false. Like you have some sort of technique. I mean, you don't have to tell me um, every stock of for example, that you invested in, but just tell me like why you chose that. Is there a technique? Is there other ways? Because, before I came to college, I didn't know there were other ways to invest versus just investing right. in stocks. Mm-hmm. I actually didn't even know how the process even worked. And it's pretty sad that a lot of people don't want to, in a sense, send the elevator back down, you know, by guiding young people or yes. guiding anybody to give them the knowledge of financial literacy. It's, it's really sad because you look at different ethnic groups in the country, you know, and yes. they will, once they get a job, they'll help their other, you know, community members get a job as well. Of course. You know, once they, of course. they reach financial success, they'll teach their children, their children's children how to reach that too. And it's, we're the only community who lacks in that. Like we will not send the elevator down for some reason. It's just, it's right. just the mentality of every man for himself. And I wanted to change that because it's like, 
we're all trying to work towards something and we have to I feel like our community is the, the main community in America that's been oppressed. If anything, mm-hmm. if mm-hmm. one of us reaches it, we should try to expose how we reach the success, you know, everybody that. instead of keeping it to ourselves. So mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I think what you're saying is absolutely phenomenal because a lot of us don't speak out on these type of topics, but these are things that we need to address in order to right. make our co- culture bigger and better. We have right. to address the things that suppresses us or oppresses us, as you so eloquently mentioned. So okay. you kind of shared, great job, you kind of shared about why you created your finance platform in specifically and your background I love that and we talked about how minorities we are pulling each other having that crab mentality specifically Mm -hmm. in the African American community and I'm sure it's not every African American community but a large Mm -hmm. part of the African American community we do kind of oppress each other and we don't help each other up why do you think that is true Giovanna What, what do you think that that comes from um, honestly, I would have to say is that, to be honest, there's a lot of different ways that I could take this in. Um, right. so one of the ways I think that people don't want to share their insight is because they felt as though it took them, like they worked so hard for it. They mm-hmm. don't want to expose it to anybody else. They want to be the one that stands out to be different from the crowd, you know? Mm-hmm. So they want to, they want to be the one, oh, that person has it. Oh, I don't know if that's making sense, but they no, want to be the one that. Sense. Mm-hmm. Right, and then there's another way that people just don't want to um from the elevator back down is because, like for example, in the job market, if an if a, if an African American gets a job in a predominantly white corporate America, you know, right. setting, they don't want to to open the door for another one of us to get in because then it looks like we are just like I don't know if I'm describing it right, but it just yeah. makes it seem like we are are just collaborating. A, Okay. No, I get what you're saying. What you, I think what you're trying to say is that we just, we don't, at the end of the day, we don't help each other up. But if we, if we do get into a position where it is predominantly other cultures and let's say the Caucasian culture, that Mm -hmm. maybe we, maybe there is a little fear there on the behalf of the person who was initially there because of the stigmatizations that our culture holistically, our society holistically holds against Mm African-American, let's just get real, African-American women, for example, because they will think sometimes that we are aggressive or we are abrasive or based on our past experiences, it would be Mm -hmm. hard to work we're hard to work with so i get right. what you're saying i think these are excellent points giovanna i think that's really Thank excellent, you. especially when you're talking about the concept of sending the elevator back down i encourage you to keep further developing that because that's something that the community whole holistically needs to examine so examine so what what made you passionate about specifically women and minorities developing financial mm-hmm. security? Right. So I'm glad that you asked me this question because um, I'm going to start off with women. I feel as though okay, awesome. I'm, I'm passionate when it comes to women and their finances because I feel as though, speaking collectively, you know, we were taught to just marry into money. Make sure that you marry somebody who's a doctor or a lawyer or engineer. I mean, we've heard this everywhere on TV. Mm -hmm. We are raised to marry somebody who has money. But a lot of the times we don't, we don't prepare for the unexpected. I mean, let's just say, for example, you get a divorce and then look, what do you have now? You know, I've seen a lot of times where, um, I've seen on TV in real life where people depend on men and, let's just say the man goes off and cheats and then you look up and you have absolutely nothing. Right. And, and now you have, now you're struggling to just make ends meet. You have a house full of kids yes. and you don't know what to do and you're struggling. And I feel like it's so important for women to make sure that they have their own finances. So when the unexpected happens, they are going to be prepared for that. And, and, and not just saying if you get a divorce or if your man leaves you, let's just say the husband dies, God forbid. Yes. Then, it, then it's like, you really have to be able to stay on your own two feet and finance yourself. Um, exactly. I remember a friend of mine, 
I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off. I remember a friend of mine was telling me how um, her, her parents were, were married and her, her father would give her mom yes. an, an allowance each month of how much that she could use. And yeah. I just felt that that was insane because she was upset because she couldn't buy herself nice clothes. And I'm just like, the same amount of work that the man put in, of course. you can do the same thing and you can bring home your own paycheck. You don't have yes. to wait for him to give you an allowance. That sounds insane to me to wait for a man to give you a, a, a paycheck in a sense when you can go out and you can work and you can get it yourself, you know? I love that. That's, I'm just so passionate because it's just women in today's society feel like mm-hmm. the man should be their source of income. And it's, and it's quite unfair to the man as well. You know, I mean, if a, if a man wants to pay for everything, I mean, it's so be it. <laughs> but I'm not going to, I'm not going to set that as a goal of mine to, to, to make sure that, oh, I have to make sure I have a man to pay for everything. I love that. You know, that's, that's mm-hmm. not a goal. Mm-hmm. And I just want to um, say one more personal story. Um, I had a friend of mine's, um, there was, I had, I had just met her. So we weren't really friends at the time, but now yes. we joke about this today. Mm-hmm. Um, we had just met and she told me that she, she went to school for four years, but in her last year, she decided to transfer out and come to school in New Jersey. Right. And she told me that she had over $250,000 in loans. And it was, yes. that number was crazy to me. Right. And, um, luckily our, our school is much cheaper. So it's not that much loans that, you know, we have now, but it's okay. still a lot of money coming in and starting back over from, you know, your first year. Of so course. she changed majors, so she's going through the whole four-year process again. And so I asked her, I said, so what is your plan on actually paying that off? Because, you know, with interest and everything, I was joking with her, but it, it's quite true. That could reach half a million dollars with interest. Of course, and yes. And her, her, her response was, I plan on marrying a ball player, a pro ball player. And yes. I was shocked because I she said that's actually a goal of mine but when I think of a goal I feel like a goal is something that you work for and you reach for and you attain it like if you ask me I'm not working for any man I'm not reaching for any man and then especially if it's just for him to pay my bills because I feel like if you if you got yourself into two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of debt then you should work on ways to pay it off instead of marrying somebody that's just going to pay it off because let's just say Let's just say they don't pay it off because I don't care if a man has a million dollars, over $250,000 to pay is a lot of money, especially if it's not even your debt. So you can't depend on a man to pay that money. And and this might even promise that you'll even marry a pro ball player, you know? And that really was sickening to me because I'm like, how do we go? And that's unfair to him. He worked hard to get to the league. Whoever he, you know, he, he worked hard to get there. Then you expect him to pay for your debt. Like yes. that was so backwards to me. So that's why I'm so passionate about women having their own money because you, you just never know. And it's, and it's unfair to, to go into a marriage thinking, oh, you're entitled to the man paying for every debt that you accumulated yourself. You I know, so that. that's right. That's why, that's why I'm in, you know, very in, 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 right about women and finances. So. I love right. that. I love that because everything you're saying is true. I have, of course, in my 47 years, have dealt with all type of different situations as well. But I am, I, I'm with you, you know, being independent. You should be independent because even when I right. think about, I, I'm right there with you. When, when you think about people who have worked really, really hard to obtain their own, and there are some people out there who are going to just say, yeah, I'm going to take care of that because that's, you know, they're the man or, or the woman or whomever right. of mm-hmm. the, the relationship. But mm-hmm. at the same time, what your point is, is to be independent enough, independent enough to where your goal doesn't enc- encompass another per- another person. You're saying right. be that person, your finances should be that person. So instead of mm-hmm. focusing on the pro ball player, let's focus on the pro financial management as right. a state. And then if you do meet someone in that instance, you're, you're a okay. So do you feel that women and minorities are more inclined to be less financially secure over our counterpart, the man, for example, men, for example? I feel like with women speaking on women, I feel like if they are less inclined, it's because they didn't work towards it. Right. Um, they, they just didn't put the effort into actually figuring out ways to, um, to take care of their, their finances, their debts, you know, 
when it comes to minorities, I feel that sometimes we just aren't taught how to manage our finances. And I went to a couple of conferences and, uh, and one of the things that they touched upon was the fact that a lot of our white counterparts are just kind of born into the literacy of finance. Like for example, a lot of them will say, I have a, a family asset or, or, right. or that's a family asset, you know, but sometimes with the, the circumstances that we're brought into, it's, it's survival. So we don't have the finances to even uh, to get a financial asset. We're just trying to make sure that we're able to eat today or, you know, it's, and it's, and it's really unfortunate that it's this way. So I feel like when it comes to minorities, sometimes we just aren't taught how to really manage our finances. It, it's right. really sad because I feel like we should be taught this in school, but we're actually not. So it's when we get out into the real world or when we go to college, we don't know what to do with money when we get it. And even when we yeah. graduate, it's like we, we have this money. Now what? I paid my bills. I have a couple of hundred dollars left. So mm -hmm. now what do I do? Oh, I'm mm -hmm. going to splurge a little bit. Like we weren't really taught like the, the importance of saving, how to start saving, things of that nature. So. I yeah. love that, which will bring me to my next point. What contributes to financial instability, in your opinion, Giovanna? Um, what contributes to financial instability? I feel like once people get, I feel like once people get over the hump of, okay, I'm making okay money, once they get to, oh, I'm making good money, they don't know exactly what to do with it. So then they're still kind of stable in a sense. They could be making more than what they, they were making, but they're still stagnant. So mm -hmm. I feel like you have to, to understand, you have to explore different avenues of ways to grow that money. You know, there's more ways of saving than a 401k, you know? And I feel like with minorities, we really have to, to take the time and, 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 and study the different, different routes, study how do we, you know, invest our finances, how do we save, you know, things of that nature. So how would you save out? Give me two, two keys of how someone should save outside of their normal, the traditional savings, which is the Roth 401k or the Roth right. or, um, uh, or just a regular savings account. What, what else would you, would you suggest Giovanna? Mm-hmm. So I would say for somebody who doesn't really know where to start, um, I would say to start off by saving just 10% and, and, and set a financial goal. Like I want to set save at least $1,000. And then I would say to explore ways through investing. Like, for example, there are stocks, there are derivatives, there are, you know, mutual mutual funds that you can invest your money in versus just taking a chunk from your paycheck and having it in a 401k. So. Okay. I love I that. Your, your no, no, that, <laughs> that, that's clear. I mean, anything on the podcast, everyone is going to take away some type of learning. So everything you're saying is spot on. You're doing a great job. So how would one okay. prepare for college? Because we kind of talked about it right. up a little bit. We kind of talked about, spoke about how you know once people get in college or once we decide mm -hmm. to take those loans what happens so how would we prepare for college even me I'm an untraditional student because I started college in my 40s so how would mm -hmm. someone prepare for college from a financial um, aspect I would say for I would say for well for me myself Mm -hmm. I would say to start a college fund as soon as you find out that you're having a child, because once you get to college, there's a lot of fees that you have to pay. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm blessed to go to a university that's amazing, that has very, very low tuition, but it's like, it's still a lot of stuff that you have to come out of pocket and pay right. for. So it's good to have a savings account once you do get to college, because let's say, for example, you, you, you're in college, everything is paid for, the dorm is paid for, your tuition is paid for, and now you're in your room, okay, do you have food? Do you have things to, 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 um, to clean the room with? You, you, there's a lot of different little stuff that you need your, your money for. Um, you're going to need money to, to travel for gas. It's just, especially I feel like coming into college, it's not ideal to have a job, so you're going to need something to back you up for when the unexpected does happen. Um, for example, like I had to, let me see, last, last semester, I, I wasn't working at all last semester. It was actually, 
a very, very hard semester for me. That was probably my hardest semester, like, ever. And I thank God because God God really cared me throughout the whole semester. But yes. it, it, it's most important that you do have some, some sort of savings with you at all times. Because when, when the unexpected happens, like, for example, I was unemployed. And mm-hmm. um, I didn't have the funding to stay on campus. So a friend of mine allowed me to stay in her room, which was so convenient because my house is about two hours away. Right. I couldn't commute back and forth. So by me staying in her room, I didn't actually even have a meal plan, you know? Right. And so I had to just make it happen, you know. In our in our, in our our um, community, we use the word finesse. So yes. I had the finesse getting into the cast and not the cast <laughs> because it was, right. it's so expensive to be on campus, you know? Right. But I feel like, when when we have that that backing, we're able to to survive in a sense. Instead of okay, now we're at college, right? And then we don't have enough to to buy food or pay for books, you know? Because I've seen sometimes where people are here, and then it's like okay, I'm 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 blessed to be here, but I don't even have enough to pay for a book, and a book is like one hundred and fifty dollars versus the right. the ten thousand that's paid for. Yes, okay, but in my savings account, I don't even have one hundred and fifty dollars to even pay for a book. You know, so it's really important for us to save before we enter college so that we have finances to really just cover everything. Because I've seen it a lot of times. Students don't have the the, 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 the finances to, to buy school supplies, to buy a laptop. You know, these things are expensive. It's not, on a grand scale of things, it's not expensive. But when you don't have it, you just don't mm-hmm. have it, you know. Mm-hmm. And so you can't really even thrive in college when you don't have the, the resources that you need, you know. Yeah, I I can agree. And when I want to go back a little bit, just real quickly, um, when we were talking about saving, do you think that this would help reduce the amount of debt occurred during while a student is in school? Oh, yes, of course, because if you can pay off your tuition like out of pocket, that will reduce a lot of debt because a lot of people go into school and they get all these loans. They're like, okay, it's paid for. But you come out of school and you have a lot of stuff, a lot of um, money that you have to pay back in student loans. But if you have $2,000, $5,000 in your savings account and you went on ahead and just paid it and, and, you know, that would be money that you don't have to pay once you get out. Because when you get out, that's going to accumulate interest. So if you already have the money saved up to pay for it, then it's best to just go ahead and pay for it right up front. Yeah. I love that. Do you think, another question came to mind, do you think even as college students that it is wise, maybe they weren't financially literate before and now they've come in contact with someone as such as yourself, should they start uh, maybe uh, like a 401, they can start investing now? You know, I know we kind of talked about, you know, parents taking the responsibility of starting their savings when their child is born. But let's say we don't have that literacy or we don't have those resources. So do you think that college students, they can still start now? Would you say that they can start by going to Edward Jones, you know, any type of investment firms? What is your take on that? Yes, I think you can start investing as soon as possible. In fact, a lot of people think that the the um, idea of investing is such this huge grand idea that it's just so hard to actually do, but it's actually not. You can go online and open up a brokerage account with, for example, TD Ameritrade or, or mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and, and you can begin investing, you know, take a look at the market. One thing I advise people to do is to just read Bloomberg, read the Wall Street Journal, look at the market. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, speculate and see, okay, do you think that this company is profitable? Should I invest now? You know, study a little bit. You can honestly invest right now. And that's a lot, a lot yes. of people don't realize that it's possible. You know, it's not like some huge, oh my gosh, I have to have $10,000 saved before I can start investing. Like, um, I think the last time I looked at Snapchat stock, it was under like $15 for one stock. Right. So a lot of people don't think that. A lot of people think you have to have like at least ten thousand dollars or at least a thousand dollars saved to start investing. But you can start off investing very, very small, just to kind of get wow. a feel of how mm-hmm. it actually works. Like for example, there's um there's small companies like like not small companies, but smaller like investment companies like like Acorn that'll give you the, the opportunity to invest your money and you can see it going up or you can see it going down. So that's a good way to start with, with companies like that. You know, if you want to just see mm-hmm. how it works. 
And um, also with trading currencies, I know um, Forex, they have a practice trading account where you can practice trading the currencies versus um, going and right into it. Again? What was that again, Giovanna? I want to make sure that they heard that last part, the last one you just um, said. Uh, Forex. Forex, okay. And they can't. Right, so that's okay. with, Right, so that's with trading currency. So you can open up a like a like a um an account to to test it out first versus actually like putting in your finances to do right. it, you know? That's right. so smart. That's so smart. I I hope the audience really caught that, especially the forex one uh, about where you can just kind of go and play around with it if you're right. not as secure with developing, but even just exploring the smaller uh decisions as far as like snapchat who would have thought to to you know invest in snapchat you said it's less than 15 dollars or acorn these are excellent examples right. that you can start now it's not an age limit there's not a time limit the point mm -hmm. from what i'm hearing you say is just to start so that we can right. build gradually up our our wealth so what are the top three actions plans that you suggest an individual should do to begin to build financial stability? I think the top three, primarily the first one is to set a financial goal. And I say that because a lot of times we don't realize that our life isn't primarily for us. We live our life for everybody around us and everyone who, who is involved. For example, I right now I don't have any kids. I'm not married or anything like right. that. But I'm setting financial goals because I know one day I will have kids and I will get married. So I want to make sure that I am stable. And in setting your financial goal, you have to figure out the why. Like, why is right. this my goal? Do I want to? Do I want to buy a house in five years? Do I want to buy a car? You know, you have to right. figure out your motive before setting the financial goal. And also, you have to realize that your finances do impact everybody around you. So I want to make sure that when I have kids or when I get married, that I'm completely fine if I had to be by myself. I don't want to be dependent on anybody else. I want to be able to take care of the things that I have to take care of. And plus, it, it'll give you freedom to be able to do what you have to do. So that's the first thing I would say is to set financial goals and, and make your, your, your objective be very significant, not just because oh, I want to reach $10,000, but, but why, you know? Because when you figure out the, the, the reason as to why you yes. need to reach that money, then you'll be able to work towards actually getting that, you know, attaining that goal. So that's the first plan of action I feel like people should do is to set a financial plan. The second one okay. I touched on a, a, a few is, is to start saving. And a lot of people feel like, okay, well, I don't really know how to save or where to start. But it's, it's very, very, very small. I remember when I was 19 years old, that was the first time I had actually gotten a bank account. And right. I didn't really, I thought I didn't need one because I always just kind of, my parents gave me money. But if I would have, you know, had one throughout the years and would have been saving, then a lot of the things that I ran into would have been taken care of, you know? Right. So I feel like the next thing people should do is to explore different avenues of saving. Yes. Um, if you have to start as small as um, having a piggy bank and throwing quarters at every, because Anything works. I remember I had a big piggy bank and I was just throwing everything in there and it came out to be $40. And that wow. was just like a month of just throwing quarters in, you know? Wow. And let's mm -hmm. just say you, you put that $40 into a savings account and you just keep adding to it, adding to it, adding to it. And you take the money and you start exploring ways to invest. Right. So I went to the next, the next plan of action is to, to start saving for the unexpected because life happens. You know, and we don't always know what's going to happen. Emergencies come up, people go to the hospital, divorces, things like that. So we have to be able to save our finances and to know how to really manage our savings accounts as well and to make sure that we're getting the right savings account. So the next point of action, I would say, is to, um, is to well, we learned this at um, Ministry. I don't know if you remember, but Brother Rose yes. used to always say, save, spend, and sow. Yes. So, um, mm -hmm. I would say with the spend part, we should spend with responsibility and, and to, to purchase with, um, purchase with responsibility as well. So let's, for, like, for example, let's say we are shopping and we're out and we see a lot of different things. We should, we should think to ourselves, okay, do I really need this 
right. item. Do I need? Do I need this? Is it? Is it like? Is it going to be like a pain if I leave home without it? So we should really purchase with responsibility and 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 to really understand why we are purchasing these things instead of just buying a whole bunch of stuff. Because there's been times where I've went out shopping and I bought a whole bunch of stuff and I didn't even use it. And I'm like, wow, that's right. $50 dollars that I could have just saved, you know? Right. Or with, with food. Like, I feel like that's a huge thing. Like, a lot of people spend there, myself, I spend a lot of my money just on food. And I'm yes. thinking, if I would have just went grocery shopping and bought something versus spending $20 or $30 for one meal... I could have been able to stretch the thirty dollars out for a lot longer. So the last one I was out, I feel it's important for us to really spend responsibly. So, yeah, I love that. I love everything you're saying. So again, you spoke about your first is to set a financial goal, to start saving and saving for the unexpected. And number four was to spend, sow, and save, which was of course something that we did learn formally. Uh, uh, previously at Ministry by Dr. Tony Rowe. So thank uh-huh. you. I, I, I love that. Let me ask you one more question and then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, give yourself about one minute on your response on this one. How can one, why is it important to set the financial goals? Again, I, I know you kind of briefly touched on it. Can you expound upon that just a little bit more outside mm-hmm. of that you know we're we're saving for the unexpected, and then we're setting. And you're saying being intentional with making your financial goals, but why else is that important? Right. So I feel like in life we are constantly progressing, right. and when I say progressing, I feel like there's a lot of things that we 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 require as we do get older. For example, a college student right now doesn't need a house. You yeah. know, so I feel like. As we progress, we need to set those goals as we progress. So I feel as though if we are constantly saving, if we are constantly mm-hmm. saying, okay, this month I'm going to have at least 2000 saved, or by the end of the year, my goal is to have um, 10000 saved, or, you know, just throwing out, you know, numbers here. I feel as though we will be, we will be okay. When I say okay, I mean that we will be financially stable. Right. So that once we set those goals, there's no, oh my gosh, like my child is in the hospital. I don't have any money. But if we have been setting goals all along, we will have enough money to take care of the, the unexpected things that happen in life. Right. And it's important for us to really make sure that we find the the why. There was a video that I had posted on my, my page. Right. And she really touched upon how we need to figure out why we need to save. Because a lot of people are saving and they're saving and it's like, okay, I have it. And, me personally, I've, there's been times where I've saved and I'm like, okay, I got it. And then I just spent it. So I feel as though we need to set those financial goals and to really set in place our objectives as to why we, we are setting these goals and why we need to reach these goals and the importance of actually attaining the financial goals. I love that. One more minute on this next question before your final question, because we, we have about an extra one minute. How can one mm-hmm. act right now to improve their finances? Outside of, you know, we talked about saving and inve- and investing. How can one act right now to improve their finances? I feel as though budgeting is really important because okay. um, it gives you a roadmap as to how you're actually going to manage those finances. So let's say, for example, if you have a set budget of um, $500 a month just for bills and then $200 a month for um, for miscellaneous, I feel like that will give you a limit as to how much you can spend and it'll show you what you should have um, outside of everything that you have spent. So I feel as though budgeting is extremely important mm-hmm. because, it, uh, yeah, it, it allows you to not go overboard, but it also gives you some, you know, cushion as to how much you can spend out of, you know, comfort, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. I, I love that. So, Giovanna, you, you've done such a great job. You've shared a lot of tips today and a lot of advice that I really have appreciated. And I know that the audience are going to be able to, they will absorb this information. So, what advice 
What would be your final advice advice that you would want to give to that college student, to that minority, or to that woman who is looking for a way to take everything that you they've been looking for this information and they need to make application to their lives? What And they're trying to stabilize their fi- finances before entering into the real world or if they're already in the real world. What would be your final tips for that, those pers- those people, and you have about one minute. You have thirty to sixty seconds. Go ahead and share. Okay. So I haven't quite touched upon this, but I feel like people do not understand the importance of credit. Yes. So I feel as though this is a very important topic because without credit, we cannot do anything. So for the women, or for the minority, or for the college student, it's so important to make sure that you are building your credit. Because let's for, let's say, for example, when you get out of college, you want to get an apartment. Sometimes people will not lease to you because you have bad credit. You know, or let's just say you would like to buy a house or buy a car. You may be able to get the loan for the house and the car, but based on your credit, it's, it's, it's going to show how much interest you, you, you will be paying over time. So a lot of people don't realize the importance of having good credit and, mm-hmm. and that we really actually do need credit. So I feel as though we need to really focus on building our credit and maintaining good credit and to really figure out the different ways on how to establish credit as well. Awesome. I love that. I think that you're right because I, in one of my courses a few months ago, it may have been last year, and we did an analysis of credit in respective to just middle class America and how much we do depend on credit and therefore we're in a repetitive cycle of debt because we're not managing our, to your point, unfortunately, a lot of us have not saved appropriately or we don't know how to invest, thereby makes mm-hmm. some type of podcast topics even more pivotal for the for just a regular working person because we need to understand that it doesn't take a lot and sometimes that gives us that fear. We think like you you mentioned earlier, oh I gotta make all this money to invest when you said we can make simple steps. Thank you so much, Giovanni. You right. did such an excellent job. Can you please oh, share you. <laughs> can you share a social media site where the where the audience can reach out to you to learn more about um financing with Giovanna? Yes, yeah, so my Instagram is Finance with Giovanna, and it, that's Finance with Giovanna. And my Facebook is Finance Talk with Giovanna. So you can go like the page on Facebook and also follow me on Instagram. I love that. I am elated to have participated in this show today. Mm-hmm. I know that someone was touched by this wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much to the Savvy Speaks. Uh, podcast guest, the other queen of the round table, Miss Giovanna Desson, founder of Finance with Giovanna, who you can find out more about this powerhouse at www.iamlisanobles.com. As a bonus visit, visit www.iamlisanobles.com slash resources dot html where you can receive free podcast resources for downloading the show today i love you i truly do and thank you for being a part of the show and remember you know my mantra and remember you are a unique combination of experiences clothed in purpose strength and destiny thank you so much for being a part of the show have a great week and i'll see you right here next time on the savvy speaks empowerment podcast bye-bye god bless